In this chapter, we get to discuss in detail the eukaryotic organisms. Some of this may be a review for you. Eukaryotes have been around for quite some time. The earliest have been here for at least 2 billion years. We know that all three of the cell types came from the last common ancestor. Of course, the earliest of them were very simple and single-celled, very similar to prokaryotes. Eventually, the individual cells came together. Once these cells came together and realized that they had the ability to provide a specific function, it was almost as if they realized that they were better together than apart, and thus we had, we then had multicellular organisms. Let's discuss structures that eukaryotes use for movement. The flagella is more complex than what we discussed in the prokaryotes. It's much thicker and has an outer covering made of the cell membrane. They also have cilia, which are more abundant and smaller than flagella. It's common in organisms like paramecium and in our respiratory tissue. The glycocalyx is carbohydrate rich and can be a slime layer or capsule as we saw in the last chapter. A eukaryote can use it for protection along with attachment. Not all eukaryotes have a cell wall. Protozoa, along with your worms, don't have this structure. In fungal cells, the cell wall is a lot more rigid and is not composed of peptidic lichen, but rather chitin or cellulose. In this figure, we can see the major components of a eukaryotic cell wall, which includes chitin, glycoproteins, and the mixed glycans. The cell membrane of a eukaryote is similar to a prokaryote's in that it is a phospholipid bilayer that is selectively permeable. One difference that is seen is that eukaryotes have different types of sterols that help to support those organisms that do not have a cell wall. The nucleus is the key organelle of eukaryotes. It's found within the cytoplasm and is surrounded by a nuclear envelope. This double membrane structure contains pores, which allows for the movement of macromolecules. Within the nucleus, we found, find the nucleolus, which is essential for the synthesis of ribosomal RNA which is necessary for protein synthesis. In the nucleus, we also see chromatin, which contains DNA, and that DNA is the set of instructions for the synthesis of proteins. In this figure, we can see the large nucleus, which is stained orange, along with the darkly stained nucleolus in the center. You can also see the nuclear envelope along with the pores. Let's continue with the internal structures. Our rough endoplasmic reticulum is studded with ribosomes and its main function is protein synthesis. The smooth ER does not contain ribosomes, so plays no role in protein synthesis. Its job is nutrient processing along with lipid synthesis. Here we can see the rough ER and a zoomed in view of the ribosomes that we'd find on its surface. The Golgi apparatus. You may have heard this guy being described as the post office or UPS. He does it all from taking the proteins made by the rough ER, modifying them, packaging them, and shipping them using condensing vesicles.
The transitional vesicles pinch off of the ER and contain the protein that was made. It then docks on the Golgi apparatus. It's modified, packaged, and then shipped using the condensing vesicles. The nucleus, ER, and Golgi are all considered to be an assembly line. The DNA contains the set of instructions to build the proteins, the ER assembles them, and then the Golgi modifies and packages them. Here we can see the ribosome components being transported via the pores to the ER. The transitional vesicles pinching off and making their way to the Golgi and then the delivery using the condensing vesicles. Lysosomes clean house using enzymes to break down food as well as microbes. They also, have, they also eliminate waste in our tissues. Vacuoles have a storage function and can be used in conjunction with lysosomes to break down food and microbes. Let's look at this process of phagocytosis or cell eating. In the first stage, we can see the cell engulfing the food, which is then brought inside the cell using a vacuole. This vacuole then combines with lysosomes. The lysosomes then release its enzymes and that assists in the digestion of the food. The mitochondria is known as the powerhouse of the cell. It is where cellular respiration occurs to produce ATP. It also has special characteristics in that it contains circular DNA, like a prokaryote, can divide on its own, and has its own ribosomes that are the size of a prokaryote rather than ADS, like a eukaryote. Here we can see the double membrane that surrounds the mitochondria, its DNA, along with ribosomes. Chloroplasts, which are found in plants and algae, take the energy from the sunlight and produce a chemical energy in the form of carbohydrates. In this process, oxygen is given off as a byproduct. Ribosomes can be found in various forms. They can be free, attached to the ER, or within the mitochondria and chloroplasts. Their function is to synthesize proteins. The cytoskeleton of a eukaryote helps to make sure organelles don't float wherever they want. It transports RNA and allows for shape changing. It's composed of actin, which can also be seen in muscle contraction, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. You can see our three components here. The actin, intermediate filaments, and the microtubules. Let's talk about endosymbiosis, which describes how our eukaryotic cells came about. Billions of years ago, we see the last common ancestor, which instead of DNA, had RNA as its genetic material. Scientists believe that viruses helped in the, devel in the development of individual cells. We have archaea, our pre-eukaryotes, and bacteria. Evidence has shown that the pre-eukaryotes ate a photosynthetic bacterial cell along with a bacterial cell that could undergo cellular respiration. These cells then developed into a mitochondria and chloroplasts, and thus we have a eukaryote. Some evidence that backs this theory is that both the mitochondria and chloroplasts have a double membrane which indicates it used to be its own cell. 
They have their own ribosomes, which resemble prokaryotes, and the mitochondria has its own DNA, which is circular like a bacteria. Our fungal cells have many forms that we can find them in. The yeast are very small, like bacteria, and reproduce via budding. When we see a filamentous form, which resembles thread, we call it hyphae. If a fungal cell is found in a chain that looks like yeast, it's called a pseudohyphae. Sometimes, fungal cells can switch between the hyphae and yeast form, which is typically what we see in the fungal cells that cause disease. Here we can see the filamentous hyphae. Here we see the yeast form, and it's pretty neat because you can see how many times a cell went through budding by counting the budding scars. There's a significant amount of fungal species that can cause infections. Those that are com community acquired could be caused by molds that cause allergies. Those in the hospital are fungal pathogens, and we also see opportunistic infections in individuals who have a weak immune system. Spores that may not do anything to a healthy individual may cause a deadly infection in an AIDS patient who has a weak immune system. We know that they can cause allergies, but some can even disturb the nervous system and cause death. Not only can fungal cells be harmful to us, but they can also be destructive to crops and can cause disease in those animals that feed on contaminated crops. A significant amount of produce are ruined by fungi as well. We've talked about the bad, but let's look, let's look at the good side of fungi. They're huge decomposers. They live in symbiotic relationships with plants. They can be used to make antibiotics along with vitamins, and we can consume them. There are various ways in which a fungal cell can acquire its nutrients. If they obtain them from organic substances, they're considered heterotrophic. If they feed off of dead organisms, they're saprobic. And if they grow on an organism, they're considered a parasite. A lot of substances are large for a fungal cell to break down, so they secrete enzymes to be able to absorb molecules. They're pretty simple in that they don't require special nutrients. If you give them a lot of salt or sugar, they're very content. Fungal cells can grow like colonies on media, very similarly to how we'd see bacteria. They can also grow in a hair-like, cotton-like appearance, which is typically what we see on our fruits and breads when they've been out too long. When we look at the fungi, we see mycelium, which helps to form the colony. We see septa, which are partitions that allow nutrients or, and organelles to move from cell to cell. Vegetative hyphae is what we physically see on our breads and fruits. The fungal cells have structures responsible for reproduction, which are called spores. A lot of fungi can use their hyphae to continuously grow, or they can use fragments. The spores are what are predominantly used in reproduction. Like seeds of a plant, the spores can travel in the wind, water, and even our pets. Once they find a nutrient source, they land and produce a new colony. There are different types of asexual spores. Your sporangiospores have a protective covering, which can rupture to release the spores. The conidiospore, 
are naked and can also be dispersed. Fungal cells can also undergo sexual spore formation, which leads to genetic variation and can benefit it for survival. Protozoa, or first animals, are single-celled organisms. They are mostly harmless and can be found in water and soil. There are some that can cause infections in humans. The protozoans have all major structures found in, found in eukaryotes except the chloroplast. They're different in that their cytoplasm is in two parts and each has a specific function, whether it be movement or feeding. All protozoans are created differently. Some of them have an early nervous system, which they can use in movement. Some have pseudopods that they can use to crawl around. Their cell membrane helps to regulate movement of food and waste, and some even have the ability to change shape. The majority of them are pretty small in size and require the use of a microscope. They're heterotrophic and cannot make their own food. Some feed on dead organisms, some use their cell membrane like a straw to absorb nutrients, and some are parasitic. The big requirement for them is moisture, and they can live in a variety of temperatures and pH. Let's look at the life cycle. In the trophozoite stage, the protozoan is feeding and will only survive if there's enough moisture. The cyst stage is highly resistant to heat, and chemicals. During this stage, the organism is resting as the conditions are harsh for it. This is how diseases associated with protozoans are spread. Let's look at the life cycle. Here we see the trophozoite or feeding stage. After they lose moisture, they transition to the cyst stage and remain dormant. Once moisture and nutrients are available, the wall of the cyst break open and the trophozoite is reactivated. Sometimes an organism may only exhibit the trophozoite stage and sometimes they rotate between the two. Trichomonas vaginalis, which is a sexually transmitted disease, only exists in the trophozoite form. So in order for it to be transmitted, intimate contact is required. Intamoeba histolytica and giardia form cysts, so they can easily be transmitted via water and food. Protozoans have the ability to reproduce both sexually and asexually. Of course, sexual reproduction gives them an evolutionary advantage due to genetic differences. This table depicts major pathogenic protozoa, which we will be discussing in great detail later this summer. They're classified based on movement. Nigleria, which is a brain-eating amoeba, has amoeboid motion and moves by crawling. Balantididium is ciliated, so moves using cilia, and is associated with gastrointestinal issues. Trichomonas, which we just discussed, is flagellated. And plasmodium, which causes malaria, is an AP complexin, which is non-motile. The helminths are our worms. They're mostly macroscopic, but parts of their life cycle are microscopic and is the mode of transmission. You wouldn't eat the pork if you could see the worm, right? Some are harmless, and of course, some are parasitic. The flatworms are thin and include the tapeworms and flukes. 
The roundworms are cylindrical. Here you can see a tapeworm and you can see the suckers that they use to attach and hang on to our intestinal wall. Here's a roundworm, which has a little more complexity to its structure. The worms are multicellular with organs along with organ systems. Those that cause disease have a very pronounced reproductive system. The life cycle of a helminth involves an egg, larval form, and adult stage. The adult can, obtains its nutrients from the host and reproduces there. In order for the helminth to continue life, it must be transmitted to a host via the egg or larval form. Wherever the larva develops is considered the intermediate host. The definitive host is where adult stage and mating occur. Common ways that we acquire these helminth infections is through consumption of contaminated food or water. There are also worms that can penetrate and burrow through our skin. You don't need to worry about memorizing this table because we will be coming back to the diseases at a later time. The eggs are very well protected to allow for survival of the helminth. Some worms can lay up to 25 million eggs per day just to make sure they can continue their life cycle. The pinworm is also known as a seat worm or anal worm. We typically find this in the large intestine. Let's discuss the life cycle. The eggs, which of course we can't see, are swallowed via contaminated foods or objects we touched. Those eggs hatch and mature in about a month. They then mate and the female worm wiggles its way to the anus and lays her eggs. Naturally, itching occurs and then subsequently scratching helps to spread the eggs. Children undoubtedly can spread these pretty easily. Child scratches and puts their hands in their mouth and the cycle continues or can spread them on a play date. Lucky for us, there's only about 50 helminths that cause disease. They do occur worldwide, but we typically see more in the warmer climates. Here in North America, they believe there are 50 million infections. Some of us may even have helminths in us and not even know it.